I'm Kostas. Um, I used to be a lead cryptographer at Tar3 before joining Calibra uh, since last year. And through this, uh, let's say, involvement to the financial, uh, let's say, uh, uh, environment in general, I was actually doing a lot of cryptography stuff for the wallet of Calibra and what you know uh, the news, obviously. And we're doing a lot of work on zero knowledge proofs for things that can be applied right now, and uh, especially for, for the wallet stuff, a joint work with some of our cryptography peers in Calibra uh, to prove the solvency of wallets and exchanges. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the, the concept of proof of solvency. Um, I will go through some, oops. Okay, wow, it's opposite. Okay. Um, so here are some results on how many clients exist today for uh, uh, wallets and exchanges. Uh, we know there are a bit more than 40 million, at least uh, uh, from a report of October to 2019, it's very recent. And we know it has been uh, four times bigger than four years ago. Actually, there are some reports that Americans are using Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all of this stuff. Uh, the report says 5%, but uh, I will explain with this note that some of these accounts are no longer active and some people are using multiple exchanges to have accounts. So in theory, it might be less than 5%, so I, I picked these three to five. Um, and we also know that one of the most popular Bitcoin wallets has also 13 million, which is a decent number. And in fact, it's even bigger than uh, some financial, let's say, investment uh, uh, companies and portfolios who have around 12 to 11 million, so Charles Schwab in the US. So it means that we're having a hype here. There are more people and more people are using uh, wallets and exchanges to, to do transactions. Um, the, other, uh, the other data around who is actually using Bitcoin and Ethereum is, uh, for some reason, are people on the 24 to 35. I'm just mentioning this. It's not related exactly to this presentation, but I'm mentioning this because we know the hype. We know how people are going to use the, the blockchain. We hope we're going to change slightly the statistics. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see how this goes. Uh, but in general, yes, there is, uh, there is some increase of users who are using Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all of these blockchains. Um, uh, and we hope they're going to use ours as well. Um, so, Let's first explain what is a VASP. Uh, usually, uh, I don't want to refer to wallets and exchanges. Imagine that there is a virtual asset service provider. We call them VASPs. All of these are platforms in which you can use uh, actually uh, coins, currencies for exchanging. And in theory, you are having um, an app. You are joining, you are registering into an app, and this app actually controls your funds. These are virtual internally to the wallet or the exchange. They are not backed. In the, in the real blockchain. And then we have this exchange, uh, which is connected to multiple blockchains, and it also has some open payment channels and all of this stuff. Imagine how difficult it is for the VASP itself to be able to prove solvency in the sense that all of the accounts here who have virtual value of assets can actually, uh, they have to be reflected on chain, one to one if you don't want to run a fractional reserve. Uh, this is not super uh, easy especially if you are not an exchange, because in theory, every distribution change on the internals of your accounting system should be reflected directly to the chain. Otherwise, a small fluctuation in the price can, can make you unsolvent. Why do we need all of these proof of solvency techniques? We all know the case of empty Gox. Um, a couple of uh, millions back then of Bitcoins have been stolen. Actually, the number is they managed to figure out and get back to 200,000 of them, so it's 650. Uh, but the price at the peak was around 17 billion in dollars. Uh, so we want a way uh, to, at a regular, let's say, and at a frequent uh, um, case, to, to be able to prove that I am solvent. The VASP, the wallet, the exchange itself is not running a fractional reserve. Also, that I haven't been compromised. So these are the two requirements for the proof of solvency. Um, and it's very easy to run a fractional reserve, especially if you are having a banking license. In theory, you can, you can do a lot of stuff. So having 10 times more uh, Bitcoin internally to your accounting uh, virtual asset compared to the assets that you have on blockchains. So you can use this as, a, as an air to do, I don't know, to, to use this money for your own investments. 
uh, however things can go wrong. Uh, and that's why you need, if you can, to prove how solvent you are. Uh, and when I'm saying this, it's actually a ratio. And practically we have the liabilities here uh, with the previous slide. Imagine that this is uh, what your clients have inside their apps. These are accounting records, right? Imagine that all of your wallets are just numbers in, in an accounting sheet. Uh, so it's not real coins reflected to blockchain. However, we have then the assets who are the real uh, blockchain assets that you have on chain. Um, so this solvency ratio, actually, if it's one, it means that all of your liabilities, if we add up all of the accounts uh, internally, it will go up to the number of Bitcoins and Ethereum and all of the cryptocurrencies we have on chain. Uh, this is actually what we want to prove here. And we're going to use some zero knowledge proofs to follow the next slides. You need to know, I will go slowly from what we had before and how we move forward into zero knowledge proofs, SGX and all of these technologies and maybe some combination of those. Uh, personally, as a cryptographer, I thought that you can do everything with zero knowledge proofs to tell you the truth. But if you go to the regulators and doctors, you will soon realize that it's not just uh, a, sum, uh, a function of some uh, equation, you're adding sums. They probably need to know more information than uh, just the liabilities equal the assets. Uh, so it's more complex, and that's why we are going to use some differential privacy as well, combining it uh, with the zero knowledge proofs. Um, so here is the, the original idea. I mean, imagine we didn't have any cryptography. Uh, you go, I mean, you are broadcasting everything. Here are all of the balances uh, of your wallet, including the information for users. So Alice has 10.34, Bob 14.66, blah, blah, blah. There is Carol with zero. And on the other side, everyone knows your addresses. I mean, your, uh, your blockchain addresses. Let's assume they're public. And they know the values there. What you do, if, if everything is public, you can see that uh, the sums are correct. So you just sum up all of the accounting values. You check against the blockchain. If you see exactly the same amount, say you say, OK, uh, you are solvent. However, what we're exposing here is wallet balances. It's very tricky. I mean, Jonathan already uh, uh, mentioned this. You don't want to reveal all of your client base to your competitors. Yes. If you're doing it like this exposed, is this good for the regulator already? Well, for the regulator, it's fine. Usually, the regulators, what they want is not to expose any data for your clients um, in the sense that there is some privacy, especially with GDPR now and all of this stuff. Imagine that this is broadcasted. It's not only sent to the regulator. It's open to everyone. So uh, obviously, they want to have as much data as possible to do the auditing. But on the other side, they want to comply with all of this regulation. So in theory, they want to at least hide this information from this side. It's fine to have all of this public, but not the internal database with user data. This is usually the most problem. Imagine you are having a high staker here. So if there was someone with some millions, in theory, you can spot who is this guy and, I don't know, threaten him or whatever you do. So we have to hide this information from the left side. So this is the app, right? These are the virtual assets uh, that you see in your app. Um, but you're exposing, yes, the individual wallet balances is something that the regulator sometimes want by sampling, but they don't want everything. Uh, the wallet identities, this is a, a no, of course. They don't want to, to know it. Um, they sometimes require to know if there, is, there are some patterns that for some reason create, I don't know, some money, lo money laundering or something else. But this is after some communication with the wallet. Uh, so in theory, we want to hide as much possible as we can. Blockchain addresses, mm, for the regulators, is fine. It seems to be fine. I'm not an expert in uh, law and all of these things, but uh, I don't see it as a problem. Mainly, this left side is the, is the huge problem we face. Blockchain balances, again, the same thing. However, we have wallet performance. Imagine that if this, all of this was public and we know that there will be an announcement from the big exchange and which is IPO for some reason, and people already know that, hey, from the previous proof of solvency, you are now having 5 billion more, with, which means that I can use this information to trade, that you are going to announce probably good results in the next proof of solvency thing. So in theory, the wallet performance should also be as, uh, let's say, as secret as possible until you announce it. And uh, obviously, 
as you can see here, we can also see the zero balance customers. Sometimes company advertise bigger numbers than the real numbers. And although they have customers, they, they don't want to reveal that we're having 50% of them are zero uh, balance clients. And obviously, you reveal the total liabilities, right? This is a broadcasting technique. It's the naive uh, way of doing uh, solvency, which has all of these uh, privacy problems. Uh, the other thing is, OK, let's not broadcast everything. Let's give this to Deloitte, who Deloitte, let's assume, is an auditor, and not to everyone else. We did that for economy, exactly that naive way. Uh, <laughs> I know. I think, I think <laughs> you're here. <laughs> So, yeah, um, anyway. I will let you know about this. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Uh, no, I'm mostly positive. Um, but yeah, so in this case, imagine that you are revealing all of this stuff, but to the auditor. Previously, before Deloitte and all of these companies are here to be official auditors of blockchains, uh, of blockchain companies, uh, I used to work with Mike Hart, by the way, uh, at R3. He was one of the first developers uh, of Satoshi. And imagine that for Bitstamp in 2014, he was asked to do the proof of solvency by himself. And it, ac it actually uh, had to prove the size of the company's deposit by having access to the MySQL database. So this is how it used to work. And Stefan Thomas, the former CTO of uh, Ripple, by the way, uh, this is very interesting for, maybe you can use it, Jonathan, for how zero knowledge proofs can be used. Before we have zero knowledge proofs, full zero knowledge proofs, uh, we have to trust the auditor, which is myself, Stefan, uh, to, have my done, my, uh, to have done my job correctly. So what this means is, a few years ago, we didn't have the option to use zero knowledge proofs because they were not ready to do all of this stuff. So we had to uh, trust people to do the proof of solvency part. And also companies were not very familiar with the cryptocurrencies, even Deloitte, I guess, back in 2014, to do the auditing. And then we, we had some progress uh, on top of this. Um, so, one way to hide information from the users, uh, at least uh, uh, when you are broadcasting something, is you can use Merkle trees. If you are familiar with hash functions, um, I will try. Who is familiar with hash functions here? Ah, okay, that's good. Uh, 70, 80 percent, which is a good number. Um, so imagine we're having all of these users. And uh, all of them have some balance, and we are providing them with some audit ID, different uh, per, per user, and we're hashing this information. So we're actually revealing this stuff to the auditor. So the second row is revealed to the auditor, but not the first one. Uh, this means that the auditor himself or uh, itself has access to some user who has some balance. The balance is public now, but not the user's information. So this is the original approach of the summation Merkle trees. And you're just creating a Merkle tree of hashes. And you're also doing the sum of, uh, of balances until you go up to the root. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the auditor, as we say, has access on this stuff. So they don't know the real name. So that is Alice. It's someone. And we're adding this audit ID to actually add some salt to the, to the hash function. And you cannot reverse it back and get to the Alice at Calibra.com. Um, so what's usually happening is before you go, you go into a proof of solvency process, you are sending some audit ID to your users. Um, and their users can do a Merkle uh, path validation of set membership so they can prove. So Bob is actually having this information. They can prove that they are part of the Merkle tree. Um, uh, in theory, what Bob can see here, as you can see, is his own balance. Obviously, it's his balance. Uh, the audit ID that he has received from the, uh, uh, from the wallet. But he can also see some information on sibling leaves. So he knows there is another user in Calibra who has 11 uh, uh, Libras or whatever it is. Um, and also, you know, if you go up to the root, there are two users from here that if we sum uh, their balances, they have 30. So you reveal some information to the users now. We have to, re we have to remove all of this uh, uh, exposure information. And uh, I will go back to what we're exposing. It's the, indivi the, the individual wallet balances are also exposed to the auditor <coughs> now. The number of customers is also exposed to the auditor. Maybe sometimes we don't want this. Uh, for some reason, if we have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a, 
a special case where one million users joined your, uh, your wallet, maybe you want to reveal that you are solvent, but not the fact that you are having such a hype. Um, so you are leaking uh, also something from multiple proof of solvencies. So imagine you are having this every week. They know your wallet performance every single week. Even if you're proving you're solvent, they know, ah, this is the rate you're increasing your client base. This is the rate you're decreasing your client base. And the customers, as I said before, they know some of our, uh, let's say, Merkle path balances. And they also know a few things about wallet performance. Even here, if this tree is somehow balanced, you can estimate the number of clients, if you, even if you don't have the number of clients. So in theory, you can see, ah, there is a Merkle tree of, I don't know, uh, high two. Probably I ha you have three to four users in your database. So you can estimate a few things, uh, especially for the users, we don't want to do this. We don't, even if the auditor has more information on what we're doing, we don't want our users to have more information on this. And then this is how we are moving to more complex tricks. What if we split the balances into some random denominations. And we're actually, uh, imagine that Alice had 17 and we break it down to 5, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, like with our, some random distribution. And then we shuffle all of the leaves and we get this, uh, let's say, obfuscation process where each user has now multiple Merkle paths up to the root. So the balance is actually split into different, uh, different paths. And you have a better, let's say, Maxwell scheme. This scheme actually, the summation tree is called Maxwell. Maxwell was the first one who uh, suggested that. So you can do something better by, by doing denominations. Um, then we will see we're going to have a tree where Alice has uh, some of the leaves, Bob has some of the leaves, and so on. So in theory, we're hiding more information now. You cannot be sure by the height of the tree how many clients there are because you don't know uh, how the splitting happened. Um, and you're also having, um, let's say, less information about the balances because, as I said before, this is shuffled here. You don't know if the uh, neighboring ones are uh, forming uh, one client or more. Um, so, so this is by far better than the previous model. And as we can see, we are... Uh, we're getting away uh, with just uh, exposing the total liabilities, so you cannot avoid that. And some information about the denomination distribution, maybe if the, the random function of splitting is, is not uh, well, uh, uh, let's say, you, you expose some information on the fact that you get the average of what would be a splitting, and maybe from the height of the tree you can define, hey, the average is three, so three times the leaves, you might have this amount of money in, and this amount of users uh, in your database. But to the customers, you're only exposing the total liabilities now. So this is by far better than the previous scheme. Um, again, this is not enough. Maybe we don't want the total liabilities too to be exposed to the customers. And this is how we can do other stuff. So before going to zero knowledge proof, I will, I will explain the hardware way of doing stuff is using SGX or anything else that has some uh, secure enclave capabilities. Uh, if you are not familiar with what is a secure enclave, I will explain it uh, very easily. So you have a way to run some calculations inside the CPU and not even the host can actually learn what is the input to the CPU and can only learn the output. So in theory, you can hide things by using SGX. A very simple, naive protocol. Uh, we haven't uh, actually uh, proven that this is secure, but we have, uh, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, good ideas on how to do it with SGX. Is imagine you're, you're having this black box, this CPU, in which you are setting the balances and the hashes, whatever you've seen before with the leaves. And you're also listing all of the blockchain addresses and balances. Let's say you're getting all of an instance of Bitcoin. You are sending the instance of Bitcoin. And you are sending also the, the left part, which are the accounting balances of your users internally. And you're also providing some proof of ski uh, ownership. The easiest way is to prove that you can sign on a challenge. Uh, so you're not using zero knowledge proofs yet. And the enclave is like a light client of Bitcoin. Let's assume this was Bitcoin. So they can see that 
um, all of these uh, active blockchain addresses are actually uh, public. Everyone can see them. So they can check that all of them are uh, bigger than zero. You have the list of um, in-wallet accounts. So you also check that the balances again are positive. And you can do this check that liabilities are uh, smaller than assets inside this enclave. You verify the key ownership. Uh, so even if you're getting as an input all of the Bitcoin addresses, you're providing proof of key, of key ownership for your addresses only. So the SGX can do this stuff. And they will say, ha, huh, from the some billions uh, that Bitcoin has, you have keys that can um, claim ownership on aggregated one billion of values. So in theory, if you sign as an enclave the Merkle root of addresses and the liabilities and just the result, true or false, you can prove to someone else that this information was co uh, computed correctly. And in theory, you have a way to simulate the zero knowledge proof inside the uh, CPU. Uh, normally, if you can go on the left top uh, corner, nothing is exposed normally. Uh, however, we know uh, that probably we have to add some noise. These SGX enclaves are prone to side channel attacks. And again, if you know how many balances I sent, so if, if I can somehow measure the, uh, the number of bytes that were, were sent into the enclave, you can learn some information on the number of users. Um, I will explain later what we can do to hide the number of users. But here, imagine that you can add some noise. So you're adding random bytes. And um, in theory, what you can do is you're simulating some extra fake users by adding zero balance user as an input. Um, this is a good way to, to hide things. However, for this particular case, we need stateful enclaves. This is a more complex situation than having enclaves that don't have a state. By state means some memory to remember someone did this and then come again back and do the same thing again and again. You need the same public key to verify the results. Um, and also we have to trust Intel. That's the main problem. I guess uh, in general, uh, as I was also exposed to R3's implementation using SGX, which takes this, uh, this path of using uh, trusted hardware. And in Calibra, we're uh, exploring all of this uh, and we're comparing all of these options. Uh, with secure enclaves, you can, yes, you can uh, somehow simulate zero knowledge proofs with secure hardware. But all of the trust models that you have that zero knowledge proofs might not have, especially uh, those without trusted setup, create some, some problems on applying this stuff uh, with a more extended trust uh, uh, threat model. And we're also not sure if SGX is prone yet to decoupling attacks. So can I deconstruct the CPU somehow? And how expensive is it to get information from the CPU? It is possible. If you see Intel's uh, documentation, they don't guarantee that it's not possible to deconstruct the CPU. They just say it's probably expensive. Um, and depending on how, how much value you can get from doing all of these uh, decapping attacks, for in some particular cases, it might be profitable to do it. So yes, there are pros and cons. However, it's more flexi flexible. You can do whatever you want inside the CPU, even more complex circuits or whatever you have compared to zero knowledge proofs. And then let's assume we cannot use uh, secure hardware or we can only use it for some parts. Imagine if we replaced everything uh, that we had before uh, in the Merkle trees with some Pedersen commitments, with some homomorphic, let's say, encryption. And uh, you also have some proofs that these numbers are positive. It's very easy to go into this model. Um, I will move one slide and then I come back again. Um, so previously, if you remember, we had some hashes here. So instead of having hashes, what you can have is some Pedersen commitments over the values. Obviously, these ones should be accompanied by some range proofs. So when clients are checking the Merkle tree paths, they can also check that the sibling cleaves are actually positive. I'm not adding a huge number. So three plus, imagine that negative numbers, when we say negative numbers in the zero knowledge proof concept and homomorphic encryption in general, is a number very close to the module of, uh, to the order of the, uh, of the group we're going to do operations. So if you are having a huge number, let's say some, some trillions, trillions of trillions, 
um, plus a small number, this can overflow and create a smaller number, even smaller than your balance. Uh, this is why you need to accompany all of this stuff with range proofs. Um, this is the provisions protocol, but I call it plus plus because we added some extra uh, tricks. Like for the blinding factors, we're using a VRF now. You don't need to send audit ID anymore. Uh, you can actually use the email of the user and in theory, uh, uh, you, can, you can hide these, imagine you're encrypting values. You can hide these encrypted values um, uh, with a deterministic way. So people are sure that the audit ID cannot be reused uh, for different clients and all of this stuff. And we also did, sorry, um, we also did add some fake balances as well. The problem with the original provision schemes is again, you are having the leaves. Even if they are encrypted, uh, as I said in the previous uh, case, you know the number of leaves. What you can do is you can commit to zero balances as many as you want, and in theory, you are going to have something that looks like this. So the users themselves know some blinding factors, which is deterministic, as we said before. We, we also have some Merkle path nodes and range proofs for the nodes, so they know if they are adding stuff, uh, they know they're not adding something which can be negative on how I explained it. And also, the auditor now knows only the root. We don't need to know more than the root because uh, the users themselves can, can check the path of the Merkle root and if they see something is not added correctly or the zero knowledge proof, the range proof is not, uh, uh, is not actually satisfied, then they can report it. Uh, so in theory, what you can learn with, <coughs> the, with the fake users addition is you can learn an upper bound for the number of customers. This is the only information you're exposing. So in the best case, I could add millions of millions of users, uh, so the tree would be bigger. However, this doesn't really affect what the auditor sees. It will affect slightly users because they will see a, a longer tree. Uh, but for the first time, we can have an auditor, we can just commit it to this value to the blockchain, and the auditor doesn't need to see all of the leaves anymore. In the previous provisions protocol, you had to do that. Um, so these are the, this is how we moved from broadcasting everything to Merkle trees. Then let's see how SGX works. And now let's go to see how we can do it with zero knowledge proofs. And eventually we have a system which is compact enough. Imagine that if we use bulletproofs or some other range proof systems, you don't even need a trusted setup for this one. You need nothing. Um, and it's usually very easy to implement it. Actually, we did implement it, so it's, it's very easy to do it. Um, however, we, we realized by speaking to regulators and auditors, <coughs> even this might not be enough. Uh, for some reason, they might need more information. So we decided, although I'm a cryptographer and I said, okay, guys, we managed to solve everything. We're not exposing now any information about clients. Let's use zero knowledge proof. This is the, the tool we need. And we realized we have to go into something more like a hybrid scheme. Um, imagine that we also want to prove that the one user is not included in the distribution of balances. So these are concepts of uh, differential privacy. Um, differential privacy, for those who are not familiar with, is we have a distribution of balances and we want to prove that this particular user was, you have some probability uh, to know if this user was in the distribution or not. And, and in some regulator cases, this was more important than revealing the total amounts. So it's more important to not being able to see if a high staker is in the system or someone else specifically, this particular user in Boston, rather than the total balances. As I said before, uh, protecting users' information is the most important thing for the auditors, except for uh, the solvency part. Uh, the zero knowledge proof is hiding almost everything. But maybe you want to hide some of it, not all of it. That's how we went into the differential privacy. So they want to relax, relax yes. the privacy? Exactly. So that they can inspect a particular person, but they're afraid of what they might learn. Yes. Okay. And these are the complexities we, we faced as well as cryptographers. It's not super easy. That's how we went into the differential privacy approach. The nice thing is we managed to combine it. So what we can do, 
is let's get the large balances. Let's assume that the high stakers is a problem. We send them to zero knowledge proofs, to Pedersen commitments, and we create a distribution for the lower balances. And then you, because you know that the large balances are actually accounting for, I don't know, 70% of the, of the distribution, it's OK. You, you manage to hide 70% of your assets, of your liabilities. The other way is to, add, to keep adding noise. And whenever you see uh, some negative noise, you send it to range proofs. And you will see how this works. And then you can also do a flat distribution. A flat distribution would mean, ah, sorry, I get this. I get all of this stuff, 2 in the power of 35. I remove, I'm removing this, and I'm sending all of, the, all of the assets into the smaller powers of 2. And eventually, I'll try to make it as flat as possible so you don't actually know how big was this in the beginning, how big was this in the beginning. So you're hiding as much information as you can, depending on the number of high stakers. However, you still have an information about the distribution, some information, some in which you can do some money laundering uh, operations and all of this stuff. Um, so this is something we tried to do. Let's assume we only had balances up to the 2 in the power of 6. And this was a distribution of bit sets uh, for accounts. Uh, the original approach is let's add some noise here, which means that you have to have a surplus. So the liability should be by far less than your asset. So you have, you have money to add and affect the distribution. So in theory, you apply some noise, positive noise, because you, in the differential uh, privacy settings, you can use an offset to uh, sample noise. And in theory, you can make sure that the offset is enough, so the noise is always positive. So eventually, from this distribution, the real distribution of our wallet, we went into this. The green parts are the noise added. But this is not usually OK. Then we can, we can do Merkle trees here, not even zero knowledge proofs, because we're not 100% sure that we're going to have this extra money, because these are extra money that we need to have for liabilities. And then we went a step further, and we said, OK, let's assume we're doing it in multiple steps. First step is we're removing the high stakers. So all of the values 2 in the power of 5 and 2 in the power of 6, we're sending them to Pedersen commitments. So these are zero knowledge proofs. You don't know about uh, Jonathan, who is a billionaire, is a, a member in our Calibra wallet or any other wallet. Um, you know the distribution of the rest, but to hide this information, you might also get some random users with smaller uh, balances to also send them in the Pedersen commitments to, to obfuscate things. Then what you're doing is you're getting some differential privacy noise uh, with some distribution, Lagrange or Gaussian, whatever. And you're trying to apply this uh, uh, noise into your real, uh, let's say, distribution. So red is negative, green is positive. So what, in theory, you can do with zero knowledge proofs, and you can, because this is negative, you're going to lose money if you're from your distribution. We cannot lose money, because liabilities now would be smaller, and we cannot have that. Let's send them, however, to Pedersen commitments. But if you have positive, do I have the extra money? If I don't have extra money, Ah, I have a pool of Pedersen commitments. Let's get some balance from them and return it back now. So in theory, what you can do is you can create whatever distribution you want eventually, or close to the original one, but slightly updated, and use all of the extra information that would be required to reconstruct this with Pedersen commitments. This was the, the idea. So you can have some information. You can reveal some information to the regulators, but not all of it. So they know some things about distribution but not all of it. And um, yes? How does the conversation with the regulator look like when you present this? It's, not super, it's not super easy. <laughs> super easy. Um, Describe the look in their eyes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the regulators are always having a more, uh, let's say, conservative approach usually. Uh, so we start at slide two, right? Yes. Um, and in theory, you, you go again and again. Uh, so we have our internal auditors, and we're trying to do to explain all of this stuff in layman's terms. As you can see, there are no maths here. I mean, super maths. You still need to know what is a Pedersen commitment. To, to explain what is a Pedersen commitment to a regulator is not an easy thing. Actually, you never succeed. Uh, but at least they can understand that it's, some, it's encrypted balances. <laughs> so this is how the conversation goes. Uh, but eventually, 
uh, I don't know, maybe it's you and all of this hype of zero-knowledge proofs, they can really understand the, the, the requirement for zero-knowledge proofs, which is, which is a good thing. Um, but yes, we have, we have all of this combination of Maxwell trees, because this will be lives in Maxwell and Pedersen commitments. So we have a hybrid scheme of zero-knowledge proofs, provisions and Maxwell at the same time, and with some differential privacy. The problem is not, uh, however, solved. Uh, this is not enough because, as you can see here, we have so many limitations and open problems that we have to discuss. Uh, the Pedersen commitment, the, 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 the homomorphic encryption stuff we've seen before, is actually using, at the moment, we're using bullet proofs to, to prove, uh, uh, for, for range proofs. Uh, however, uh, it, it cannot be applied in, in keys that they are already hashed. I mean, you cannot see the public key. You have the hash of the public key. You have to create some circuits uh, for this stuff. And this complicates situation. So it would be better if Bitcoin never has the keys, but then it wouldn't be secure against post-quantum attacks or at least up to a point. And um, also, uh, the, the current model of Libra is also uh, with hashed keys. So we need to create special circuits to uh, accommodate this as well. So maybe we need to go to ZK snarks. However, who runs the trusted setup again? Is it the auditor? Do we trust the auditor to, to run the trusted setup? Can we create something? Uh, maybe there are systems, actually there are systems, in which you run a trusted setup for the cryptocurrency itself, but it works for generic circuits, and you can reuse this to create, uh, uh, let's say, the circuits for, for the proof of solvency part. The other thing is, again, the circuits might be more complex because you have to accommodate multi-sig wallets then the situation is even more complex. How do you prove ownership uh, where one account has a K out of N structure? Right, but this is also the case for designated verifiers, right? Because yes. If you're, an, you're a regulator that wants to ask a question at some given point, we can say, well, this is my, uh, you know, this is my challenge, prove, prove in zero knowledge. Yes, this challenge. You, you can do this. Uh, however, as you can see before, um, this, these systems, might be auditorless, because in theory this information is public to both of the users. So a user can self can be a, an auditor in this particular case. Maybe you don't ha you don't have the power to go to the auditor and do challenges because customers won't believe you. Maybe you collude with the auditor. So yes, we have to play this game. How much do we trust the auditor for all of this uh, information? Even the challenges. Do you trust the challenges of the auditor? Maybe the, this client doesn't. Um, and okay, and also we have the locked funds. How do you prove ownership of a payment channel, uh, let's say, balance? It's even more complex. And there is also uh, an interesting attack that we find that we found. You can actually have a risk-free attack there because you can pre-sign a payment channel, uh, let's say, transaction. You send the previous one to the auditor. However. I internally to the payment channel, I will send you the money anyway, even if I can cheat, um, I, cannot, I cannot get your money. You will get your money by unlocking the channel with a new signed transaction. So th there are, there are risk-free attacks for payment channels, and this is a problem in general. And atomic swaps. There are money who are locked. Is it your asset or it's not your asset? These are serious problems to, to see how we can solve them in, even in zero knowledge proof without uh, strong collusion threat models. And um, other in uh, interesting things that I realized from the auditors as well and the regulators, they might need to do sampling. Even if you have uh, zero knowledge proofs, they might say, I want to see the third leaf is there. Because one of the problems of all of this uh, situation is that the users, it's accounting balances in the wallet, right? It's accounting balances in the wallet. The users cannot actually provide any cryptographic evidence if their balance is not in the tree. How do you know? One day, one of your bank might say you have zero. How do you prove it wasn't you that sent the money to someone else? And the bank did it, and one employee of the bank did it internally. It's very difficult to have this proof, right? To, because there are just numbers in an accounting sheet. How do you prove that all of your actions actually were initiated by you in this trading platform? Uh, it, it's super difficult to have this uh, dispute resolution thing. So what we're trying to do is every time we're having an internal 
to the wallet transaction, there is a mutual contract. The user sends a signature, hey, this is my transaction order, and the wallet reply back, replies back, hey, I got your transaction order and his, it has been successfully executed. So in this particular sense, you have an evidence, a cryptographic evidence to, to prove to the auditor. And this is the final slide. Um, the, one of the problems is HSMs and cold wallets. Uh, personally, I'm in the team of HSMs uh, these days, and it's not super easy to, to provide proof of solvency challenges, like to prove ownership of the key, if the HSM doesn't support it. The HSM can only sign. How do you... You have to provide custom logic to the HSM, and this is what I'm doing, uh, by the way, and how you also secure the blinding factors. What we haven't actually... I, I don't see if there is any work in Zero Knowledge Proof. I've also asked it in the forum, I guess, in the Zero Knowledge Proof forum. There, there is no anything out there to say, hey, this is how you secure your blinding factors into the HSM, because this is also confidential information. How do, you, how do we store blinding factors now? Uh, we, have to, we have to create protocols for this stuff. And Yes, and also it's not easily uh, defined how we can do the proof solvency in privacy-preserving cryptocurrencies. There are ways to do it, but if you get to the complexity of multi, uh, um, let's say, multi-owned assets and all of this stuff, it's more complex. Uh, yeah, that's that's all. I know there are a few maths here, uh, but yeah, let's take questions offline if you want to learn more.